This is Ramdas Here and Now. I'm Raghu Marcus. And this week we have another edition of the podcast that follows a little bit in the wake of the wonderful Alan Watts Ramdas combination podcast that we did a couple of weeks ago. It was the last podcast in the Here and Now series. Boy, did we get wonderful response. And it was great for all of us to hear Ram Dass and, uh, and Alan together in, in one podcast. You get the real feel of each of their perspectives. So what we've done is put together real nuggets from Ram Dass's core teachings around death and dying. And there is a reason for that because we have this incredible new podcast from Mirabai Bush, who is, many of you know, of course, Mirabai, and she has been, she's part of the Love Serve Remember Foundation board. She's the chair. She has been working in, uh, had a wonderful organization, still has, called contemplativemind.org, and uh And she was with us in India when Ram Dass went back the second time. Walking Each Other Home, that is the name of the book that she and Ram Dass did that Mirabai actually wrote uh, after spending uh, much time with Ram Dass on a day-to-day basis in his home in Maui. And we thought, oh, well, this is uh, an opportunity to go back to some of the subject matter from the book using... Uh, and, and in the book, much of what uh, we are doing uh, in terms of this compilation of, of material is reflected in the book. So that's the reason for being, raison d'être. And we're going to do a fun thing, too, because Mirabai's first guest is John Densmore. John, who played drums for The Doors. And uh, he wrote a new book called The Seekers. It's all of his fantastic experiences with all sorts of legendary figures from music business and on. And we're going to give that book away. We're going to do a giveaway. And all you got to do is listen to Mirabai, listen to the first podcast with John, and then go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and a review automatically. You will be entered uh, to win Uh, one of John's books, and it'll be announced on March 17th. So, And it'll help out to getting Mirabai's podcast uh, on the boards, as they say. So back to the compilation. So uh, there are just, uh, I know these very well, um, as I've been so closely associated with the Working with the material, uh, of course, our expert, Nathan Wilborn, put this together for us. And the first thing that's up is it's called Love, Loss, and Soul. And it's Ramdas actually reading a letter he wrote to some people, a family who had a, a, a son that died in a swimming accident in Hawaii. And, you know, there's no even accounting for what they were put through, you know, young man, early 20s. And what Ramdas said is so fantastic. And uh, we, uh, I don't know, I, I've sent it myself to a number of people who have had similar experiences and just wanted to know what Ramdas might have said about it. Uh, so, um, yeah, this, this is something to, to refer to for anybody who has had, uh, most especially someone in the family, a younger person or a younger friend or anything like that, um, this is just uh, right on the mark from Ramdas. And then uh, the next one is about grief and um, being with dying people. I mean, Ramdas used to say all the time when when we would talk about this, it's just a matter of being a loving rock. And that always meant to me to be completely solid, not falling into the fear of dying, being with a person who is dying. And that, of course, takes uh, much work on our parts to be able to get into the place where you, we are not 
grasping at holding on to what we think is the reality of a body and uh, nothing more. So, and the loving part is, uh, of course, just sitting there and and just focusing on what Ramdas used to call loving awareness. Doing a loving awareness meditation, so everything that you are relating to, everything that uh, you are seeing around you, is simply from a completely non-judgmental place and a place where. Uh, you're standing behind any preferences, and then you can be that loving rock. Uh, he talks also, there's one called Karma and Death, and that you know talks about what we've accrued over lifetimes and how we can be an advantage point of letting it run off without judgment, without hanging on, without the grasping, clinging that is our day-to-day a lot as humans, which we have to accept. Um, but, you know, you get to the point, this is the work that one needs to do way in front, way before you get to the point where you're in your advanced years. And uh, much more better to do the practices that... Uh, we can realize, like he's talking about karma, we can realize how we are creating karma through grasping and clinging and how uh, that certainly is, uh, affects us in that moment when we leave this planet. Uh, hold on tightly, let go lightly is the next piece and it's uh, placing inside oneself or finding the place inside oneself that is not afraid and uh, realizing that balance by opening to the, making friends with the mystery, as, as Roshi Halifax might say it. So, yeah, dealing with fear. And then the last one is is, is uh, God, it's so inspired the way that Ramdas uh, just relates making peace with death. And, and again, appreciating the cycle of living and dying. He said, see it as a culminating ad- adventure. And, and the reality is the work that we do, and I've, I guess I'm reiterating something that I really feel is important, which is starting to work on this, not when you're in your 60s, 70s, but when you you start to realize there is a path and that you are on this path and you are following your intuition, you are trusting that place inside that knows that you are not the body, you are not the mind, stops believing in the stories that uh, one would tell oneself, and that uh, over that period of time, that kind of work allows for a real acceptance and and a realization that working through all of these aspects of attachment and fear will really dissolve some of those um, very, very pernicious, the pernicious grip, (laughs) I can't even say it, pernicious grip of of attachment, of the kalashas, the obscurations, greed, anger. And it is through the transformation of, of, of all of these formulations that we can finally get into a place where we're not walking around fearing, especially when we get into middle age. Um, But people leave at any point uh, during during a lifetime, and you never know. And so very, very much the, uh, the opportunity is always there to work on that aspect and to realize it. Um, cultivate the many ways that we are not mind, body, and emotions. 
And and uh, the key thing Ramdas says here is um, in one of these little nuggets, the way that is understood in the morning, this is this kind of the close of Becoming Nobody film, the way that is understood in the morning, we can gladly die in the evening. And that's exactly reflects what I've been talking about, which is starting at a very, very, uh, as soon as you know there is a path, that's the starting point. And uh, so this is uh, just all great, great information. And again, I urge you to check out Mirabai Bush's Walking Each Other Home podcast. Just check in at Be Here Now Network, sign up uh, and uh, put your email in there. They'll give you a notification when that's going to be happening. But uh, I believe I know it's going to be happening March 4th. I'm going to take a wild shot at that. And uh, don't forget, you can get one of John Densmore's books. Uh, called The Seekers, John Densmore from The Doors. And uh, just listen to the podcast and go to iTunes and leave a rating and a review and you'll automatically be uh, part of the possibility of getting a free book sent to you. Okay, that's it for the moment. And this is Ramdas here and now. On Be Here Now Network, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com. So many great podcasts are going on there. And uh, from Jack Kornfield to Christian Doss to Sharon Salzberg and Joseph Goldstein. And me, me, mind rolling. Check it out. We'll see you next week. I received a letter in April from... Um a man who was a, um, he worked on the assembly line in Detroit at the automotive Ford Motor Company. And he said that his son, 23 years old, um, had gone to Hawaii on a vacation with some friends and was snorkeling, uh, looking underwater at the fish with a tube. And uh, about after they'd been there for a while, it was the first time for all of them son was a very healthy athlete and a good swimmer. Uh, they saw him just uh, staying down a long time and they found that he had uh, drowned and his, um, he, he was brain dead. Uh, and uh, they put him on a respirator and the father flew to Hawaii and uh, at great expense of $50,000 flew him back in an ambulance plane to the United to the mainland and then after a few weeks, when he was brain dead, finally had to be responsible to pull the plug on the respirator and then watch his son die. And um, he talked about what a wonderful boy this boy was, what a wonderful job he had. He was a very devoted son. Uh, he would never leave home. He'd never stay out late at night without calling home so that his parents wouldn't, or wouldn't worry. Um, and um, he said, they say that God is perfect, but all I can think of is that God made a mistake. I cannot believe there would be any good reason for him to allow this to happen. And then he said, three lives have been destroyed, not just one. My wife is a truly great woman and she did not deserve this. I'm 60 years old and she's 50. He was our future. And now everything seems futile and empty. And I wake up crying every morning. And then he says, uh, I feel it's cruel to send my son off into uh, eternal life because he doesn't know anyone there. Only his grandparents and my wife's side are there before him, but he never knew them because they passed away while he was very young. Uh, to think of him as lonely makes it unbearable for me. I pray you can give me some insight and understanding as to why this has happened and where he is now. And he said, uh, I wish to, people keep explaining this incident as an accident. I don't believe this was an accident. I can reiterate eight or nine things that happened as I look back over the months that preceded this tragedy and we see that it was all leading up to the occurrence. I won't go into them now, but I think something was there, etc. 
Okay, so um, I won't read the whole letter I wrote to him, but I'll read some of it. I feel such pain for the loss that you and your wife have suffered. The grief that parents experience at the loss of a child is perhaps the deepest grief of all because it seems to upset the natural order of things. What I can share with you from a spiritual vantage point cannot really allay your grief. Perhaps, however, it may allow you and your son to know each other in another way, and that other way of knowing may give balance to the grief. Uh, then I go on to say that because your son was attractive and was your son and so warm and vibrant, you got to know him through his uniqueness and his separateness. Um, there is another way of knowing a person, which we know through our intuitive heart. This way of knowing one another is subtle, and so it is often hidden behind the more obvious ways of knowing people through senses and thought. But if we know what to look for and cultivate that intuitive way of knowing, we find out for ourselves that we are each indeed more than just body and personality. While no name is entirely satisfactory for this other dimension of ourselves, for the purpose of our discussion, the word soul will do. And what is this soul? It is a unique entity which, when the time is right, clothes itself in a personality and body to take birth on the physical human plane. This personality and body are much like space suits for dwelling on Earth. Can you hear me when I'm reading this? Inevitably, in all but the rarest cases, within a few years, the infant becomes so strongly identified with its space suit that it loses its memory of its initial identity as a soul. Then we live out life engaged in our human vocations until our death when we leave behind the space suit and once again remember our true selves as souls. Now the soul itself has an agenda in taking birth as a human being. It has certain work to do and complete while on the earth plane, and it uses the body and personality to carry out this work. And when the work is finished, it leaves this plane. The wisest beings with whom I have made contact in this lifetime all assure me that a soul leaves the physical plane neither a moment too early nor a moment too late. Now to us on earth, who so strongly identify with our own bodies and personalities, this is hard to understand. To us, because we have usually not listened deeply enough inside ourselves to know differently, consider duration in life as an asset. We tend to think of the earth plane as the be all end all, so that we want to make it last as long as possible. However, once one begins to look at life from the soul's point of view, the picture is quite different. A human birth is a bit like enrolling in the fourth grade, and we stay just as long as it is necessary to achieve what we need from that specific grade or form, and then we are naturally ready to go on for further evolution by leaving this plane. I can sense from your description of your son and from the pictures, he, he sent me pictures, the purity of his heart and the beauty of his soul. And I suspect that though you considered his work on earth just at the beginning, for his soul, the work was completed. Even the manner of his leaving was part of his work. Now, I realize that for you, it is inconceivable that a son who would call when he was going to be late at night could possibly leave you in such a fashion by choice. But you see, it was not his personality's choice, but his soul's choice. His personality, in fact, would never be able to leave you because of the power of the bonds of human attached love that existed between you and your wife and him. But the soul is not limited by human attached love because it knows and is joined to others by what is sometimes called the love that surpasseth understanding. It is conscious or spiritual love. It is the love that Christ shares with his father. It is the same love that binds you and Keith together far more deeply than even the human love of father and son. Now, when your grief is at its strongest, it is hard to tune in to this deeper love, especially since it makes no rational sense. However, you already have intimations and later it will become much clearer to you that the true love that you and your son share is untouched by these recent events. 
for the, in the dimension where this love exists, that is soul love, there is neither coming nor going. That love is not vulnerable to time or changes in form. Only when your mind will be quiet enough will your heart give you the reassurance that you seek that the essence of the love is still very much with you. As I said at the outset, this in no way will negate the pain of the loss of his form to which you were deeply attached. But it will balance that loss with a new opportunity. For now that his captivating form is no longer present, you are more free to make contact with his soul, especially as you are able to acknowledge your own. Do you hear that? The question of whether your life has been destroyed by this event is another point that is touched by our discussion. For your personality, the pain is shattering and seemingly unbearable. I have no doubt that you awaken crying and find life now meaningless. Such suffering is what the personality would avoid at all costs if it were able. For your soul, however, it is an entirely different matter. For your soul, suffering is that which forces you to grow spiritually and brings you closer to awakening to whom you in truth are. I realize, even as I say all these things to you, that it is really too much for me to ask of you that you understand the way in which the manner of your son's death was his soul's gift to your soul. I suspect all that seems topsy-turvy to you, but you did ask me how I understood such tragic events, and this is my truth that I'm honored to share with you. Actually, however, from the tone of your letter, the premonitions, etc., I suspect that you are more ripe to hear these things than even you suspect. Now, as to how your son is, I can only intuit that a moment after he left his body, after leaving a thread of consciousness in his body for some weeks to give you a chance to get adjusted to the loss and giving you the opportunity to help him along the way, he was filled with an indescribable light of the most profound love. Even though there were not people familiar to him from his stay on earth to greet him, there were many beings most familiar to his soul ready to welcome him. But probably your suffering and attachment to him and sense of loss is felt by his soul. Although he now understands what has happened, why it had to happen the way it did, and why you are suffering as you are, I'm sure he is surrounding you with healing energy. And as you're able to quiet your mind, I suspect that you will feel it. It, of course, acts to your benefit even if you don't feel it. To the extent that you're able to sit quietly and just hang out with your son, talking to him as you normally would about the many experiences you shared together. But in doing so, look to see the thread of spirit that pervaded each experience. Imagine that you and he are souls who met on earth this time as father and son. How many times in your years together did the love between you nearly rend the veil of mystery that would have allowed you to recognize the truth of soul that lay at the root of your relationship? It takes only a moment for two people to recognize their bond as souls. For souls know no time. And now, even though your son is no longer embodied, you and he can recognize one another. In no way do I think there was an error on your part in removing the life support system. Your hand was guided by deeper forces of truth within yourself. Under such conditions, we do what must be done. Let your mind be at ease about this. Were it not your son's time to leave his body, there is no way you could have done what you did. You were just playing your part. Grief is the, um, the realization of the loss of a dream. Um, if you have a relationship with somebody, you build an expectation and a model of what that, of, of reality with your mind. And then when that is torn away, when that person dies or leaves you or s something happens, the breaking of that expectation takes away your security, so there's fear, but also 
there is incredible feeling of loss, of sadness, of feeling incomplete because you built the sense of your completeness around living within your dreams. And when the dream collapses, it's as if your whole identity has died. There's a, there's a, a, a mini death involved because we know ourselves in part through our relationships with all the people around us. It's like when my father died last September, I, I went around to say to everybody, now I'm an orphan, you know, which is bizarre. I mean, I, the word orphan doesn't usually seem relevant to somebody that's 58 years old. Can't milk it much, you know. It's not like a, a little tyke that's an orphan. But I, I was an orphan, and I, but I saw that something very profound changed in me. That up until then, even though dad was 90 and I was definitely out on my own for many, many years, there was a way in which my identity in terms of elder and child and something changed. And there was a loss of the security that came or the security that came from being identified as always having somebody that was my elder and that was there to finally protect me or take care of me or something and it really is grieving is that grief is the mind's attempt to deal with the the breakdown of expectation and what you do to deal with grief is that at first you grab states of mind or grab models to try to make it go away or to counteract it because it has a feeling it's raw and it has emotional qualities that are that are very difficult to be with sometimes because they're they are interpreted as negative feelings sadness depression crying and the tricky or the art is not to grab prematurely to try to make it go away like a lot of people who break off in a relationship and then start to grieve over the loss of relationship, react to their grieving by grabbing a new relationship. And they're building the new relationship on the sand of the grieving of the old one. And they haven't given it the space to run its course through to come out the other end. So I'm inclined always to push people back into grief rather than to bring them out, but not have any model about how people should grieve. You know, I don't feel that you got to cry or you got to open up or anything. How do I know how you're supposed to grieve? Some people grieve very quietly and some people shree and shy and cry and scream and rent their hair and their garments and stuff like that. And I don't see that there's much difference in all that. I don't think you've got to show emotion. But I think there is a timing, there is a healing process that goes on as you start to exist after the dream has died, the model, the relational concept. And then after a while, there's a kind of a natural way in which the raw ends kind of heal a bit and you start to find new ways of being in the universe. And that's just very gentle. And up until that time, it's like a roller coaster. A person gets very sad and then they seem to be all better. Everybody says, oh, you've dealt with it very well. And you come up and you're all smiley. And then suddenly it hits you again. I mean, it can hit you with seeing somebody's shoes or their old, you know, biscuit box or whatever. I mean, suddenly you're, you know, you're, you're, it awakens it again until finally... You can live with all this stuff and you can feel the bitter sweetness. And the, the art of grief is not to see a lot of, there's a, a lot of subtle thing about grief is where people feel that if I stop grieving, I am betraying the person or the thing that left because I'm forgetting and I must remember or else I wasn't a true lover. The extraordinary thing about it is that as you quiet down from the active process of grieving, you quiet down and you listen and you begin to appreciate that the way in which you are with another person in love exists independent of coming and going, even independent of death and all of those things. 
and that you see that what you were grieving was at the plane at which you were a separate entity and there was separation. At the plane at which there's unity, it's Ramana Maharshi, the saint said when he was dying of cancer and everybody said to him, Bhagwan, Bhagwan, don't leave us, don't leave us. And he looked confused, he says, don't be silly, where could I go? I mean, I'm just dropping the body, I'm not going anywhere. And so you realize that the grieving is part of the dramatic storyline of your separateness. Because you can't grieve for something that didn't go anywhere. And it's interesting because even if you break off with a lover and there's acrimony, to the extent that there was even a moment of true love between the two of you, of true transcendent oneness, that's there. That thing has no time and space connected with it. We keep reducing relationships into time and space. Like if you loved me, you'd spend more time with me. You wouldn't leave me. I watched when Maharaji, people would come to Maharaji. The reason he said Jao so quickly was that what had to be transmitted between two human beings takes just that long. I watched it. I watched it happen. I watched the minute if the person was ripe to come into a space of unconditional love for one flicker of a second, there's the up, and then it's done. And everything else of the collecting is lack of faith. That what really happened, really happened. And it's very profound to me now. And I, that has tempered my life a lot because I now am not willing to spend as much time with people as I used to, to reassure them that the love is there. And I see it as their needfulness constantly. Do you love me? How much time will you spend to me? Will you do this with me? Will you do that? Can I have more of you? And it's because they can't get inside behind to the place where, where could we go from one another? And I find it extremely uh, interesting to love people more and more and awaken in them the feelings of love and then watch their minds take that and turn it into something that fear touches so that then they want to grab it and collect it and be testing it and being sure about it. And when you want to say, it's here, it's here. We don't even have to see each other again and it's still here. That's a big one to ask of people. I understand that. And you look at death and you see it's the heaviest melodrama going. It's the one that sucks everybody in. You might be very, very spacious about everything. Ah, working, ah, children, are playing. But you come to death and it's suddenly, I'm dying. At first, when you were trying to get high, you were trying to push away the things that brought you down. Then, when you want to get free, you see that the only things that bring you down are yourself. Nothing's bringing you down but your own attachments. So that the things that get you in life are the secret, they're the clue to your stash of attachments of mind. And you begin to see how each thing that gets you is showing you where you're holding, where you're still clinging to a model of this versus that, of I want this, but I don't want that. I like this, but I don't like that. And the quietness of mind is standing behind preferences. You stand behind the this versus the that, the yin versus the yang, the, all of the polarities. You stand in the one behind the two. So now, once you want to be free, at first you want to hang out with people that keep you high. Later, you want to confront the fires that catch you. You want to purify through those fires. You just find yourself drawn towards the things that are still catching you so that you can get to the point where you can be in them but not lost in them, where you can keep your space even when you're in them. And dying is one of the big ones that sucks everybody in. And so part of the work is developing the ability to be with somebody that's dying or be dying yourself and stay very clear and very present. Because those that are from uh, religions that focus on the moment of death, which is most of the religions that have reincarnation in them, see life as a preparation for the moment of death. They see that. And they see, as Don Juan says, that you keep death over your left shoulder. You live each moment as if it's your last moment, not in a kind of macabre, uh, horrible, negative way, but in a way in which each moment is, 
is the one where if it's to be your death moment, it's, ah, here I am, right. And that'll be that moment. And then the next moment is the, what follows after the incarnation is what's created by the attachments of the moment of death. So that those beings that are gonna go into the white light are about three quarters of the way turned around before the moment of death. They're already right here with all of it, even before they die. So that a lot of the work you're doing in a lifetime is the preparation for the moment of death. And keeping death present enriches the moment of life. That the optimum way to be healed is the optimum way to die, which is your full consciousness. But your full consciousness is, listens, does what it can to preserve the precious human body, but also allows what is to be. And a lot of people lose it because they are so attached to which way it all goes all the time. Like I work with people that are having like a slow illness, a terminal illness, and they're losing their motor abilities and their control, sphincter controls and things. And each stage they lose. I watch some people who are able to open to the new stage and say, ah, so. And those people don't suffer. And then I watch somebody who looks at the shoes in the closet they'll never wear again and sits around feeling sorry because they can't wear those shoes anymore. They're holding on to the model of who they were a moment ago. A moment ago, there was somebody wearing those shoes. Now they're not wearing those shoes. The minute you let go into what is, ah. Uh, the minute you hold on to a model of what might be, or what ought to be, or what should be, or what was suffering, it's that disparity that creates the suffering. So that any time there is suffering, it's a clue to where your mind is holding. And that's why you keep using suffering. Finally, suffering is the tastiest clues about your stash. It's a very interesting thing to play with. And so with death, just the people that open to each stage of consciousness and move with it, don't suffer the same way at all, not at all. And there's a whole other level of the game and that's what the Tibetan book, the Egyptian book of the dead are about. It's what all of the understanding of death as the deepest teaching of a lifetime. It's the best vehicle for awakening. If you only identify with that which dies, why would you want a teaching at the time of death? The minute you identify with the soul or with the awareness or with something else, you can see that death from a curriculum point of view is one of the topics of the curriculum. And the question is, how much you can learn from that. Now, some of us like me want to be around dying people because it's a way for me to work on my own attachments. It's the same way as in Southern Buddhism, they send the monks into the cemeteries to meditate on the decaying corpse, on the uh, different corpses, states of the corpses in the uh, cemetery. In order to get them free of that attachment to body, to see that the body changes and it decays. Well, uh, we, don't, we don't have that access in this culture. So I like to work with people whose bodies are decaying because it gives me a chance to work with my reactions to that and see where my attachments are, where my fears are to all that. And then there are people who are facing a terminal illness who would like to be in a place where everybody doesn't get sucked into their drama. It's interesting about how powerful that drama is. So when I walk into a room, I just start to be with another person. And then we explore together whatever the drama is. Here's an example. Jean Newman's. Jean is a, uh, she's an awareness that was in a 62-year-old body of a Quaker woman in Boston, very close to death. She asked me to come and see her. So I came to see her and I came up into the room. Her husband brought me up and then he left, went downstairs. And she said to me, Ramdas, I finished my work on earth. I want to die. I want you to help me die. Now that statement could have come from channel four, from Seoul. That would be like the Tibetan Lama who sends out postcards saying, next Thursday at two, I'm leaving my body. Won't you come by for tea? 
and you go and you have tea, and then he turns around three times, sits down, goes into samadhi, and leaves his body. It could have come from there. But intuitively, I'm listening and feeling, and it's not. It's coming from her ego. She's saying, I've decided I've finished, and I'm going to leave. So my response to that was, Gene, how do you know you're supposed to die yet? Maybe you're going to lose each sense, sense by sense. Milk it for all you can. It's a precious birth. Don't rush. She said, but Ramdas, I'm so bored. You hear that one? Empty, listen. Of course you're bored, Gene. If you have to do anything full time, it's boring. You got to die all day long. Couldn't you die like 10 minutes an hour? You know, do you have to be dying all the time? It's interesting how dying is so preoccupying, everybody gets caught in doing it all the time. And it gets very dull. She said, but I feel as if there is, everything is too much, too much, too much energy, too much light. People are too much. Everything is, feels too much to me. What I experienced was an image that as a person opens into, gets closer to death and opens into these higher planes of consciousness, they tune to more and more and more energy until the white light is all the energy in the universe. And if you're holding on to who you think you are as the, you open into these other planes, it's too much energy. It's like a, being a one-quart container and trying to pour in two gallons of water. So, well, Gene, gee, that's because, maybe because you're holding on too tight. Why don't we expand outward together, Gene? Gene and I sat there and I said, you hear the clock ticking? Let's experience it inside of ourselves. Hear the children playing outside? Let's experience it inside of ourselves. Feel the counterpane under your fingertips? Experience it inside of yourself. My voice inside of us. And we just started to expand outward until it got very, very spacious in the room. Whole, the light of the room was a very purple color. And I looked at her, she was just radiant with light. After a while, I said, she sat up and she started to hold me and caress my ear and we started to kiss and hug. And it was like a celebration of form from the point of view of formless. After a while, I said, well, Gene, you know what I know. Probably I won't see you again in this body. So stay conscious. And I left. They called me the next morning at 7.30. Her husband say she had died during the night. And he said her dying was just like ink being poured into water. It was just expanding outward. He said, I came away from her death with one of the deepest experiences of peace I'd ever had in my life. And it's interesting that when it works, when a person stays conscious through that transition, if you're around them, you end up feeling like you have been blessed. You feel like you have just experienced incredible grace, incredible grace of somebody who is just like Christ did it, showing you the ephemeral nature of the body from a quiet space. Now the karma that we have accrued over many lifetimes, as we start to awaken in the middle of a lifetime, not after death, but in the middle of a lifetime, like we are doing here, then we start to live our lives consciously in such a way that we don't create new karma. But the old karma keeps running off, and it may run off for many lifetimes. Right? And even though you've prepared yourself right up to the moment of death, so that you're ready to keep God in mind as you die. At the moment when the ego structure starts to disintegrate and there is what is called the review or seeing your life flash before you and all the events that have happened in your life and the way in which you have loved or hurt or whatever you've done and past births, all of it, there is whatever karma is left will grab at that point. And that grabbing will start to determine what your next work is in your next birth. 
so that you can anticipate that although you get yourself very clear and very ready and very open and very flowing, you don't necessarily wipe out all your karma. You may still have more work to do. But the difference is that when you die consciously, openly going towards it, there is no karma created by the death process itself. For the clinging to life at the moment of death, that yearning keeps creating life after life after life after life. And it's at the point where you let go of physical plane existence that you can start to get on with it in terms of other work you have to do. When Mahatma Gandhi was dying, he walked out into his yard. An assassin shot him three times. Our images of assassins in America, think of Kennedy brothers, Martin Luther King, and always there's horror and violence connected with it. And we see, we imagine if we can, the moment that somebody's shot, that they are stunned or confused. Gandhi had just as much time as any of the others when he shot, and as he shot, as he falls over, he just says, Ram. Just he goes out on the name of God. He's ready for his death because every moment of life is the moment of death. And when you are deep enough into like Vipassana meditation and you see thought being created, preserved and destroyed, you see the universe being born and dying over and over again with all your thoughts. And you see that life is a series of mini deaths and rebirths. The whole process you see as death and birth, not only seasons, but thought forms and the universe as you create it. Now, perhaps the biggest fear of aging is the fear of death. And um, as long as you are identified with your separateness and you think that's what you are, you will have fear. And if you cultivate the part of you that is not identified with your separateness, you will have a place in you that is not afraid as well as the place in you that is afraid. You'll have a balancing of those things. And you might even get light enough. A Zen monk is dying and his, he hasn't written his death poems. Zen monks are supposed to write death poems. And his students say to him, Master, you haven't written your death poem yet. And he says, oh, I haven't written my death poem. And he grabs the brush and he calligraphies madly and he dies. And it says, birth is thus, death is thus, verse or no verse, what's the fuss? <laughs> now, um, my guru helped change uh, my feelings about, I mean, I had had many experiences of what are called out-of-body experiences, so I had a sense that I wasn't this body anyway. But my guru was walking with one of his old devotees and he started, my guru started to laugh and the old devotee said, what are you laughing about? He says, well, so-and-so, this old woman devotee just died. And the friend said, what are you laughing about? What are you, some kind of a butcher? And Maharaji said to him, what would you like me to do? Make believe I'm one of the puppets? Would you like me to make believe it's all that real? Now the question is, where does somebody go? What happens? It's a mystery. When I sit with that mystery, all the experiences I've had, I don't even have a flicker of anything other than an appreciation that when we drop our body, we just drop our body. Ramana Maharshi is dying and the people say, don't leave, don't leave. And he says, don't be silly. Where could I go? It's like I'm just selling the Ford. I'm not going anywhere, you know. No, don't leave us. Don't leave us. It's just a shift of form. And if you have loved somebody in the love that transcends form, even for a moment, you and they aren't going anywhere. Your mind may say they've gone, but that's your mind. The minute you quiet down, go back into your heart, they're right there again. And love really does transcend death. There's not even a doubt in my mind about it. And you remember when I said to Emmanuel, my spook friend, Manuel, what shall I tell people about dying? He said, tell them it's absolutely safe. <laughs> he said, it's like taking off a tight shoe. <laughs> <laughs> you 
See, that's the world I live in. So when I have a sense of who we are that is so much more vast, Buddha said, do you know how many times you have taken birth like this? He said, imagine a mountain six miles long, six miles wide, and six miles high. And every hundred years, a bird flies over the mountain with a silk scarf in its beak. And it runs the scarf across the mountain once every hundred years. In the length of time, it would take the scarf to wear away the mountain. That's how long you've been doing this. Sure gives you a different perspective, doesn't it? About time and the meaning of a life. Can you see a life as so precious and beautiful and still learn how to hold on tightly, let go lightly? How to not cling to it? How to be open to the mystery and open to the next part of it by saying, okay, and now this, and now this. In the Tibetan tradition, when you're dying, you are trained to stay in the moment. Instead of the model, I am dying, you are just in the moment. The earth element leaves, you notice heaviness. The water element leaves, you notice dryness. The fire element leaves, you notice coldness. The air element leaves, you notice the out-breath is longer than the in-breath. Just moment, 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 now this, now this, now this. I have been sitting now with dying people for 10, 15 years, I guess. And I can tell you that it is the richest experience of my life. It is such incredible grace. The two things that awaken the same feelings in me are being present at a birth and being present at a death. And at that moment of death, when you feel the awareness leave the body, and when that person's connection to that which is beyond their body is deep enough because they have relaxed the mind that keeps grabbing at their separateness so that they can just let go very gently. There's not even a ripping. There's not a pushing. There's not a grabbing. The whole secret is to live this moment fully. Now this moment. Now this moment. So if you're in this one, how do you know the next one may be the one you die in? The best preparation for your dying is that you live this moment now, fully. Moment by moment. And then one of them will be the one in which you drop your body. And it'll just be another moment, nothing special. It's not really that dramatic. We milk it so much. Such a big drama. Will he die? Won't he die? Should she die? Mm. Sure, we're all going to die. I want to tell you a secret. You're all going to die. But though you perish, you will not die. The whole secret is of extricating yourself from identification with form because all form corrupts. It all dies. You take care of it, you honor it, you clean it up, you keep it healthy, as it is slowly corrupting. Hold on tightly, let go lightly. Just recognize what an adventure this transformation is. The appreciation of death and the spiritual journey after death is the prerequisite for living life joyfully now. Death does not have to be treated as an enemy for you to delight in life. Keeping death present in your consciousness as one of the greatest mysteries and as the moment of incredible transformation imbues this moment with added richness and energy that otherwise is used up in denial. I encourage you to make peace with death, to see it as the culminating adventure of this adventure called life. It is not an error. 
It is not a failure. It is taking off a tight shoe, which you have worn well. But those that find the way in the morning can gladly die in the evening, it is said in the mystical literature. So I encourage you to explore and find in your being that part of you that is on those other channels so that when on channels one and two the World Turns series comes to its final chapters, you won't be caught in feeling loss, but rather the adventure. Because from where I'm sitting, life on this plane of reality, because I live in the world of reincarnation, of karma, of life on this plane, is like being in the fourth grade. You took birth here because you had certain work to do that involves the suffering you do, the kinds of situations you found yourself in. This is your curriculum, it's not an error. Where you are now with all your neuroses and your problem, you're sitting in just the right place. Imagine that, imagine that, nobody made an error. And all that stuff in you of saying, if only, if only, I could be, no, this is it, including the if only. It's perfect. And then at the time you graduate and somebody says, oh, but he died so young. So if you graduate from fourth grade early, big deal, wonderful. Don't get so caught in worshiping life that you lose the balance, that realizing that the spirit it says, live life fully and richly as a partner with God, and at the same moment, don't be afraid of the next thing. Go towards it with openness and with love, and not with forbidding. The way that is understood in the morning, one can gladly die in the evening. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation, and ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.